to the Olathe Presbyterian Church for 30, 40 years, the Olathe School District, and, um, and to our church throughout that time. His parents, Brooks and Doris, were members long ago, and, and um, we reach out with sympathy to Marianne and to his family. I'm going to begin, uh, you know, I don't like Stephen Colbert, sorry, not a big fan, not a big fan really of any of the late night shows anymore, because I'm old and crunchy, I suppose, but they don't represent my values at all, and that's okay, I live in a world where it doesn't represent my values, heck, sometimes I don't represent my values, <laughs> amen, but he's got me hooked on something lately, sorry Ian, because, uh, but the questionnaire, Have you, uh, he has a questionnaire, and it's called the Colbert Questionnaire about how he gets to know people. And what hooked me was one of the questions, not what number am I thinking of or um, the other questions he asks, like uh, apples or oranges, least favorite smell. But he asks, what do you think happens when we die? You know, I want to know what those people think. I want to see if, if and, and I haven't found one who could say anything with confidence. Not one has mentioned Jesus yet. haven't seen them all, but I even looked at John Krasinski. I had hoped that he would say something about Jesus because I have a sense that he's a Christ follower somewhere, but nothing, no word of mention. I don't know if they're afraid because it might do something to their career to say something as simple as, I believe when the body dies, the spirit lives. And Jesus said in John 14 that I will come and take you to be with me. I know exactly what happens when you die. You go to the Father or you go to hell. Not one has said you go to the Father. Not one has said the Spirit lives in those words. Wow. Am I that out of touch? Are they that? Who's out of touch? Right? What is our God capable of doing? And what, what are we witnessing in our culture? The reason I bring that up this morning is because we're witnesses, they're witnesses. And, and Moses was going to make a witness to Pharaoh. And what Moses said is, let my people go. What Pharaoh said is, heck no. And there were people watching. And we're witnesses in a world. When Moses and Aaron met with Pharaoh, remember the scene. What did it look like? This is from a movie. But every scene I look at, as they describe it, he could have been outside. He could have been in the palace. Certainly, we're going to read where Moses meets Pharaoh by the sea next week when they turn the river into blood. But, but here is a scene, and you know there are people around. There's aides and advisors and children as Moses and Aaron meet. And there's always the dude with the fan. Remember the fan man? <laughs> and I want him to be your point of view. You and I are, we're not Moses. We're not Pharaoh, and we're not Aaron. We're just holding the fan, watching it happen. But even the fan man's part of the scene. Amen? What is witnessed is often the point, and witnesses cannot escape the story. You don't get to be a celebrity and just say what you think. Something's going to happen when you die, and you need to know what it is. And when I hear guys say, oh, you just blend into consciousness, I want, well, what do you base that on? What's your proof? A question as important as what happens when you die, you should have something to base it on. I base mine on the claim of Scripture that I didn't write. And the power of the Holy Spirit that witnesses to me that, yes, boy, I have a spirit and a body. And there is a God who has invited me to know him and who is active in the world and who invites Pharaoh to let his people go. Remember what happened. Moses asked Pharaoh, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. These people have been in slavery for 400 years now. There's probably 2 million of them, men, women, children, and and others with them. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to our Lord, or he may strike us with plagues. He's not saying, let us go forever. Moses is saying, I think he's sincere. I don't think Moses is just doing what God said for him to do. Let us leave Egypt and worship our God. And for this... The response from Pharaoh is, you, you're lazy. That's what you are. Lazy. Let us go and sacrifice. Who's the Lord? I don't know the Lord. Get back to work. And In fact, because you had the audacity to ask this of me, I'm not even going to give you straw to make the bricks. Make the same amount of bricks, yet do it. Get your own dang straw. In essence, he turns the fire hoses on them. 
And we've witnessed that in our culture. When Martin Luther King said, live up, Junior, said, live up to, your con- live up to the Constitution. Are we not created equal? Well, stop giving us our own places to drink water and our own hotels to sleep in and treating us differently all around the world. Let, live up to your standards. And they turn the hoses on him for asking that, and they sick the dogs on him. And Satan's in the dogs. Dogs aren't full of Satan. The effort to stop truth by force is satanic. Amen? To resist the will of God is satanic. The Israelite overseers turned on Moses. Hey, you just made it rough on us. Moses came to do the thing they're praying for. When he did it, the people who were to be freed attacked him. We talked last week how if you try to help a family of, that's stuck in an addiction and you're the first one to say, got a problem over here, expect to be attacked. So they go to Moses and Aaron and say, what have you done? There is no freedom without difficulty, folks. There is no salvation without somebody dying. Amen? And that somebody says, we too have to die. It's brutal to come out of the hand of Satan and into the hand of the Lord. It's a free gift, but the the walking it out is quite the path. Moses went to the Lord and said sort of the same thing. Why have you done this to me? Moses is arguing with the hand that's trying to save them. Ever been there? But God does not say, zap, you're done. He just keeps working with them. And the Lord says to Moses, now you'll see. And I love the Lord's now. God's now is always now and not yet. Until we die. And then, boy, is it now. What happens when you die? You're in the arms of the Lord. You're in the house of the Lord. You escape the expanding universe. You go to where there is no time. Guess when you get there? Same time as everybody else. We'll talk about that later. You'll see. That's faith. I will see. I believe. What happens when you die, Kirk? Well, Stephen, I'm going to die into Jesus. My body will die, but my spirit will never die. And neither will yours, Stephen. Your spirit's not going to die. Where's it going to live? That's the question. But I'll see God. Not because I'm good. Not because I deserve it. Because he said it. And I believe it. Read John. It's all about belief. What do you believe? That's a great question that Stephen's asking. Are you answering it to your neighbors, to yourself? Now, the Lord said to Moses, you'll see what I'll do to Pharaoh because of my hand. He will let them go. Because of my hand, he will drive them out. It's not about you, Moses. Moses always makes it about him. And for that, I understand. God said to Moses, I am the Lord. There's the key word, I am, I am. It's the same phrase for which they killed Jesus. Before Abraham, I am. Oh, no, you don't, dude. You're claiming to be God? That's what he said. And, and, and here's Moses. I'm paraphrasing. Here's what God says to Moses in the, um, the Kirk translation. Moses, you always answer my call with who am I, or I can't, or my knee hurts, or I, I, I. When I ask you to do something, why has it always got to be about you? It's who I am that matters. That's why he told him his name. If I go to the Jews, who do I say he's calling? Tell them, I am, I be, the one who is, the one who will make it happen. I am the am that's got this. I will do it. Get out of your own head and into my will, Moses. Now, I only know that's what God says because I think I've heard it said to me. Has it ever been said to you? Get out of your head. Not don't think. Never don't think. But why has it always got to be about you? That's the sickness we have. We make everything about us. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. This is what he really said. To God Almighty. But my name, the Lord. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known. But my name, I am. I did not make myself fully known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites. I hear, I see, I care, and I've come, Moses. Now's the time. Get up. I've remembered my covenant. 
It's been 600 years. I never forgot it. When, when the Bible says remembered, it means taking a discernible action. And that time is now. So let's review the covenant. I'm going to go, because there's seven of them. God said to Abraham in Genesis 17, I'll make you fruitful. I'll make nations. I'll establish my covenant. It'll be an everlasting covenant. I'll give you the land. I'll be your God. My covenant with, with your descendants. And the sign of that covenant is circumcision. Every male eight days old, you will circumcise. We skipped just last chapter. Moses is making his way back to see Pharaoh, and he's forgotten to be circumcised, and he gets struck down. And his wife saves his life by taking him through circumcision because they knew that's what he were doing. But Moses, Moses learned the hard way. Moses is a lot like Peter. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. As for Sarah, I'll bless her and give you a son by her. It will be through Sarah, not Hagar. That's the promise. That's the covenant. She'll be the mother of nations. She'll have a son. Of, and, and, and as God is giving him this covenant, Abraham falls down laughing. At 99, I'm going to have a son? Are you kidding me? And God says, and you'll name him Laughter. And I will establish my covenant with him. So God is on the record in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 21. I'm making a nation. From this nation, I'll bless people. This nation will have a land. You will live in this land. You'll bless the whole earth. And from you will come the one to bless the whole earth. In Exodus 6, this is the next step in our scripture today. God says, therefore, go to Pharaoh and go to the Israelites and tell them, I'm the Lord. Go to your own people and say, I am. Not who are you, Moses. Not who are you, Aaron. Not who are you, them. But I am the Lord. I'll, I will. And these are seven I wills that answer the seven I wills of the covenant. Isn't that interesting? It's a restatement. I'll bring you out from under the yoke. And these are separate things if you, if you parse them out. I'll free you from being slaves to them. So I'll bring you out physically, and I'll free you mentally. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm. Whose arms were outstretched on the cross? Isn't that not amazing? But also, I'll redeem you with your outstretched arm. When you drop that rod, thy rod and thy staff, into the river, and I'll be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. You know, when we pray to Christ, when we share the, the, the sacraments, it's the same. It's God. The God who rescued Egypt rescues us. That's why we have the whole Bible in this church. And I'll bring you into the land. Not only were they put back in Israel, but as we'll see, we will be taken to heaven. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. As for you, this is all couched in a, in a I will and you will. It's a, it's a covenant. It's an agreement. I'll keep my part. You keep your part. What's your part? Circumcise as a sign and obey. They never did. God will give them the tender commandments, and they can't keep them. And neither can we. Egypt is a picture of the broken, rebellious heart of man that doesn't know what happens when we die unless someone tells us from above. And this broken man, through this family, into this problem comes Jesus with the outstretched arm. Jeremiah 31, long after Israel's been put back in the land, been taken out by rebellion, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. See, the reason I put so much scripture up because I want you to have a firm, educated understanding that what we believe isn't just smoke and good talk. It's built on the history of the word, amen? The word just nails it. I grew up in a family of lawyers. If you said something and couldn't back it up, you got smoked. And I want you to be witnesses in a world where nobody can smoke you. You pin it down. Take him to Jeremiah 31. You, know, you got people who say, well, you mix polyester, and they get all wound up in the law. The covenant law has been, what did Jesus say on the cross? Finished. Not blotted away, not wiped away, real. Only he's the one who could keep it. But looking forward to this time, the Old Testament, the 
prophet Jeremiah said, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was the husband to them, they cheated on me. This is the covenant I will make with the people after that time. And it's seven. Interesting. I'll put my law in their minds. Not on paper, not on stone. And write it on their hearts. Remember, physically, emotionally. I'll be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will know me. They'll have a personal relationship is what that means. From the least of them to the greatest. For I'll forgive their wickedness and I'll remember their sins no more. And the people could yearn for this, but they couldn't see how it would happen. They didn't even see how it was happening when it was happening. But listen to the New Testament, Luke 22. Jesus took bread, and, and we're talking now about the new covenant. And so Moses was speaking to his people, and God is saying, here's the covenant, remember it, speak it to Pharaoh, I'm going to back it up. And God did his part. Israel never did their part, but it led them to understand that God would finish the covenant through Christ, who took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. That's why that's in there. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews says, he is the mediator of a new promise. It's not that the old one failed on God's part. It failed on our part. But Jesus is the perfect one who kept it, fully man, fully God, able to obey its demands, and on the cross offered his blood as sacrifice, which God accepted and gives us a new covenant in his body, and that new covenant is that we believe and follow Christ, but that all the work that is done is done. It is finished. You are not saved by your obedience to the law. You're saved by his. You're saved by your faith in what he's done. So therefore, he's the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first the sins committed under the first covenant. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be in you, with you forever. The spirit of truth. See, this Holy Spirit living in us is the gift. It's the residue. It's what Jesus offers the believer. It's the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31. He will be in you. It's literally what Jesus says. The world can't accept him. The world, the, the, the people at odds with the Lord who will not acknowledge the Lord, who don't know what happens when they die, it can't accept it because it doesn't see him or know him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans. What happens when you die? Well, I ain't orphan, brother. He's come to me and I'm going to him. Because I live, you also will live. I'm just waiting for somebody to say that. What a witness that would be. Man, don't take your cues from Hollywood. They don't know anything. They ask good questions. That's, that's the role of art. But you better have answers. That's the role of faith. Oh, I have seven scriptures, by the way, to nail down what you can hope in. Those were three. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. What Moses is telling Pharaoh, Jesus completes. We live under a new covenant. That's why on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Christ has obtained a ministry that's more excellent than the old. As the covenant he mediates is better, since it's enacted on better, firmer promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there'd been no occasion to look for a second. But the scripture says he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. In 2 Corinthians, he has made us competent to be ministers, you and I, um, speakers, witnesses of a new covenant, not of the letter anymore, because the letter kills. I can't live by the letter. 
If Jesus says, uh, if you hate your neighbor in your heart, you're a murderer. I can't live by that. I have to know I'm forgiven. No, the new covenant is the spirit. And it gives life. It reminds me that those who trust in Jesus are guaranteed their salvation. I can't wait for somebody to answer the question that way. So what is the will of God? It's to save you. You will be saved when you believe. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Jesus says, I will come back and take you to be with me. What happens when you die? For me who believe in Jesus, he will come back and take me to be with him. Oh, pray somebody says that. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. I actually think, by the way, that um, Stephen Colbert, I think he claims to be a Christian. He may know this stuff. It's just not getting said. It's not getting witnessed to. So I don't want to be unfair to him. It's not about him. How would you answer it? What's your witness? In John 11, Jesus says to Martha, whose brother is dead, your brother will rise again. He who believes in me will live and will never die. Your body dies, not your spirit. Oh, Jerusalem, Jesus said, I long to bring you home, but you're not willing. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When there's a death, there's a will, and the will is certain. Jesus' death fulfills the first covenant and ushers in the second Oh, our Savior wants all men to be saved and women and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator. What happens when you die? There is one God and one mediator. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. Man, I'm laying it out like a lawyer. Amen? You have reason to believe this. I didn't make it up, and it's been happening for thousands of years so that you and I could sit here today and be filled by the spirit of confidence, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of friendship with God, of knowing he's done all this to rescue us. On this side of Easter, we're witnesses to the full picture. We're hearing way more than Pharaoh's fan man heard. And I believe Pharaoh's fan man heard by the eighth promise said, Pharaoh, don't disobey. Do what he says. I even, I even. And when he said the firstborn's going to die, Pharaoh's fan man dropped his fan and got some sheep blood and put it over his door because it says in Exodus, when the Egyptians left, a whole bunch of other people went with them because some people witnessed it and believed. And that's what I'm asking of you. So take your fearful, rebellious, I'm not, and I can't, and I won't, and I don't want us. You know what? A lot of I can't is just a, a sheltering for I don't want to. Come on, man, get up and read the word. Come on, man, get up and bless your neighbor. Come on, man, get up and be a witness. I can't because of these reasons. When you're just hiding the fact that I don't want to. Amen? Get off that boob tube. I don't want to. Get away from that thing that's a habit for you. Right? Take your I'm not so much to the I am. It's not about you. Here's the other way to look at it. One step in faith changes everything. You can have seven problems over here, but start stepping with God. And pretty soon the issue over there is over there. You're here. Let's pray. Father God, we are witnesses. And we've heard and seen what you've done. We acknowledge it. We appreciate it. We love it. We receive it by faith. Lord God, you have blessed everyone in this room with your clear call today to believe, to rest in the finishedness of it, and to rest in the you are-ness, the I am-ness that you bring us. 
that overcomes all the ams that we are. And Father God, help us to step out today in faith. That, that thing that's enslaved us, help us to be witnesses that you have the power over slavery, not only of the body, but of the mind. You made a promise to forgive and release and heal and finish, and we believe you've done it. And so we act like it's true before we might think it's true. We live in your truth, over and above our feelings and our fears. Oh, Lord, deliverer. Deliver your people now. In Jesus' name, by faith we pray. Amen. Having heard